just off the coast, about 15 miles from uh, the Egyptian coast. Um, the Israeli army had, on the 5th of June, flown low over the Med, came in from the west side, and destroyed about 80 to 90 percent of the Egyptian air force. The um, Israelis, Israeli army, attacked across the Sinai, uh, destroyed the army, the Egyptian army, and then um, President Nasser convinced King Hussein to attack with the uh, Jordanian army in uh, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. The um, Israelis pulled their forces out um, and went and went north and uh, pushed the Jorda Jordanians back to uh, back to the Jordan River, and that's now the uh, West Bank. And then the army went north to uh, the Golan Heights and fought off the Syrian army, and in a week time, five days, they destroyed three, three armies. Israel cl claimed a mistaken identity, as you'll see in the video we have. Uh, the Liberty became the most decorated U.S. ship with uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor awarded at the Navy Yard with President Johnson uh, giving diplomas to high school students four miles away, which was unheard of. Uh, his citation said, uh, East, Eastern uh, Mediterranean, but never mentioned uh, Israel. Only one of the citations mentioned Israel, and the, and in addition to that, there were 172 Purple Hearts. The American media was uh, not giving given coverage. In fact, there was a reporter on the USS. Um, America, that uh, I have some messages there, and they got very upset because they were afraid he was going to talk to the crew. Congress refused to hold hearings, even, uh, and the VFW and American Legion have both passed resolu resolutions calling on. Um, Congress to hold hearings, which they probably never will. The original stone at the Arlington Cemetery said the people were killed in the Eastern Mediterranean. Survivors were told not to ever talk about that again. And my crew, when we were going through the messages, my boss said, uh, we're packing these up and I have a message here that talks about um, uh, getting all the information and, and returning it, boxing it. And we were told not to say anything about this. I was born in World War II in Washington, D.C. My dad worked for the Department of Agriculture and I And when the war started, he joined the Navy and um, eventually was gunnery officer on the USS Power. And uh, my mom worked for a senator from Idaho. And when the war started, she um, went to work for the War Department, the Navy Department. 
After the war, my dad was transferred to Kansas City, went back with the Department of Agriculture. I grew up in Dallas. And in Dallas in the early 50s, there were three television stations. And they weren't broadcasting all the time. Our television had an analog dial here. It wasn't the click, click, click. It was analog, and you could tune between stations. And as you know, there was never a channel one. So channel two uh, was the bottom of the dial, but you know, a little kid playing around, I found out that I could tune below the dial and get shortwave. Uh, so I could get Radio Moscow, and I could get uh, <laughs> Radio Prague, and I could get uh, Voice of America. In all these languages, I'd, I didn't have the slightest idea if they were Martian or what they were. Also on Channel 2, uh, when the weather conditions were right, and you had um, some of the stations broadcast on Channel 2, and as a uh, cold front came down, we call those Blue Northers in, in Dallas because you'd have a big black cloud coming in, and the next morning you'd have red dust from, from uh, Oklahoma all over everything. And I could tune to Channel 2, and um, for just briefly, those stations, they had a test pattern and they had a uh, uh, name of the station and the location, the city. And so those stations would fade in and fade out, and I had a big chief book and I would log the time and the uh, city and you'd start with Oklahoma City and go down to maybe Texarkana or Memphis or uh, Shreveport and and uh, so I could pick up those uh, stations. How old were you? Ten maybe? Twelve? Uh, I also found out that uh, the TVs were a lot of problems. They had, my TV had 37 tubes. The, um, there was always something going wrong. And I found out that uh, tubes in a certain area, like if it was a black, uh, completely dead, it was a rectifier tube. Or if it was just snow, it was the uh, tubes close to the antenna. I could pull those out take them up to, uh, everybody had a tube tester. The 7-Eleven had a tube tester and the drugstore had a tube tester and I could test those tubes and uh, fix the TV usually. The neighbors found out that uh, this nerdy little guy could fix their TVs because sometimes you had to wait two weeks for a repairman and you had to, um, uh, pay, they, they charge maybe as much as $20. And so I, I could fix their TVs and they'd pay me $2 or maybe even friends of my family would pay me $5. <laughs> At that time you could ride all over Dallas uh, on the bus and uh, no, nothing to worry about and I'd go down sometimes with my friends to the thrift stores and buy radios for 50 cents, bring them home, strip out all the resistors, all the capacitors, all the uh, tube sockets, and then build things. Back then, everybody was building. Everybody worked on their cars. The kids had plastic uh, model airplanes. I had them hanging from the ceiling of my room, plastic ships. Um, electronics, Heathkit uh, was one of the manufacturers of kits and you could build all kinds of electronics things. Um, so as, besides the TV repair, another source of income was uh, pop bottles. You could get two cents for a pop bottle and the neighbors would put out uh, the bottles next to the garbage can the uh, 
families that drank beer would hide their beer bottles at the bottom of the trash can. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the morning, if I had time before school, I'd go down the alley and pick up pop bottles. And uh, sometimes I'd go to school smelling a little like garbage because I'd go through and get the beer bottles. With some of those parts for my high school science fair project, I built a Doppler radar. And uh, I could set it up on the side of the road, side by the uh, street and from my house. And as a car went by, I could uh, detect how fast he was going. My uh, Boy Scout radio merit badge counselor worked at Texas Instruments and he calibrated the audio frequency meter and, and miles per hour for me. Um, upstairs, the way I remember the Cold War, we've got some really neat artifacts upstairs, almost directly. Uh, there's a school desk that m most people don't even think about when they walk into that room. I remember the principal being on the uh, uh, PA system saying, this is a drill, this is a drill, duck and cover. You'd get under your desk, you'd cover the back of your neck, and uh, the teacher would close the windows and pull down the black shades, and people in Denver are complaining about uh, the schools not having air conditioning, but hot in, Den in Dallas isn't hot compared to Denver. And, uh, also in that same room is the Conrad radios. We have a, uh, a transistor radio that uh, in, during Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had a radio directional finder and they homed right in on uh, KGMD 590 playing Hawaiian music. They didn't have to worry about compass readings and uh, a few months later, Jimmy Doolittle took off from the Hornet. And did the same thing. They took off as a group and as they approached the Japanese coast, they fanned out to different cities, homing in on the radio stations that were on the air. So, Connell read, when we realized that the Soviets had stolen the atom bomb and they were building planes that could fly over the uh, North Pole, Conrad became a big thing because that would prevent them from homing in on, for instance, Dallas, because you had frequency diversity. Frequency would jump from 640 to 1240 and back and forth and also location, different locations. Everybody else would be off the air except the uh, designated Connell Red stations, which in Dallas were WFAA and KRLD and maybe another one. Across that room up there is the B-36. There's a um, poster of the B-36. They were built at the Convair plant just west of Dallas, between Dallas and Fort Worth. And when, when those things were flying, also they were stationed at Carswell Air Force Base in, in uh, Fort Worth. And you could hear them five miles away. They were the largest wingspan of any bomber ever built. They had six pusher uh, prop engines when they'd fly over the house and you'd look up, they'd almost cover the sky and um, all the windows would shake, all the doors would shake. It was, it was an amazing thing. In the next room, I have a uh, display of my Heathkit radio verification cards that I got from all over at, at you know, when you're a little kid and the only thing you get in the mail once a month is Boy's Life magazine. 
and you're able to get um, mail from Russia, mail from Czechoslovakia, mail from all over the world by listening to stations and sending in, in a report and they'd send you verification and all kinds of information. So that was a, um, you have to see that up there because I've got quite a few uh, cards. <coughs> You lost your place on your... Oh, okay. I went two years to school in, in Austin at the University of Texas. My dad was transferred up to uh, Kansas City, and so I finished up at KU. And right after we moved there, I'd already been in Army ROTC at the University of Texas, and I, uh, because the Navy required 2020 vision, and I couldn't get into Navy ROTC. So when we transferred up to, um, when my dad was transferred up to Kansas, I'd read an article that if you had an amateur extra radio license and you could copy Morse code 25 words a minute, you could join the Navy Reserve as an E3, immediately take or immediately take the test for radium and third. So I went down to the recruiters and I said I'd like to join up under this program, and they said there's no such program. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in. They called me a week later and they said, come down, take the test. And one of the tests was um, 78 RPM code aptitude test uh, at five words a minute. And I already knew the code. They said, nobody's ever made 100% on this. The, um, they gave me, uh, they swore me in, gave me a uniform, and I told the chief uh, radio man, I'm ready to take the third class test. And he says, nobody comes in off the street and makes third class without knowing about the Navy. <laughs> and he said, um, he was really upset because I skipped boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> They couldn't send an E3 to boot camp. <laughs> so I took the, uh, when I graduated from KU, I'd already applied OCS. I, uh, I you know, the, the reason I couldn't take the uh, third class test was a radio man has to know how to type. And I copied the 25 words a minute with a pencil. So I learned how to type listening to Morse code. Went to OCS, I graduated, and uh, they said, pick a type ship or a coast. And I picked uh, overseas uh, communications, which they said is a waste of your, uh, your um, choice. I got uh, Navcom State Greece. I went to communication school, got orders to Greece. They gave me, uh, I flew into Rome, and they'd had a coup the day before. The military had taken over the government. And on the newspapers, there were, um, pictures of buildings destroyed and tanks in the street. I flew to Athens, um, Navy picked me up, went through downtown Athens and there wasn't anything like that. I read later in Time Magazine that those were pictures of Budapest. <laughs> so talk about fake news back then. <laughs> uh, What year was that? This was April 22nd, 
1967. Navcom State Greece was right on Marathon Bay. Air Force was just south of uh, Athens at the airport. This whole area was, uh, you had Albania, uh, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, were all Soviet. NATO, Greece, Italy, Greece, Turkey. Um, you had uh, Israel, UAR, Syria, and um, we had some, on Crete, we had an air base, and we had a naval base. You had intercept sites all over the Israelis, had an intercept site uh, north of Tel Aviv. We had an intercept site with the Brits on Cyprus. And uh, you'll see later that the US, uh, USS of America was about in this position south of Crete at that time, and that Saratoga was east of Crete, and the Liberty was down here off of Alexander. Naval Communications Station was the first portable station. Uh, it had what was called a Woolen Weber antenna, which was a uh, the Germans had developed it in World War II, and it was a directional antenna uh, that uh, was elect electronically steered. <coughs> this is Voice Highcom back in this area. Uh, we had IBM 360s in this area. Um, and the day workers mostly spent time here and we had, uh, this is the receiver site down at the Bay of Marathon, which was about two miles away, um, where the battle between the Persians and the Athenians and the Marathon runner ran to uh, Athens to warn them of the attack was just down the road there. I mentioned Voice Highcom. This is a room that was separate. Uh, we covered for the Greek Coast Guard um, pleasure boats that got in trouble. Uh, we could communicate with them. And so this will come up later because that's where we were able to talk to the Liberty. I had uh, a watch section of 30 to 40 uh, uh, radio men, and we stood uh, watches, um, two mids, two eves, two days, and I had 72 hours off. And on those 72 hours off, because I was a junior officer for 15 months, they were bringing people from People that rotated in, rotated from Vietnam, and um, they, because they could have a choice of uh, duty, and most, or a lot of people chose shore duty Europe. So as, as some of my collateral duties, I was BOQ bar manager, had to have plenty of cold beer for the day workers. <laughs> uh, I was pre Protestant chapel fund, um, in charge of that, I had to pick up the money after church and, and hold on to it and deposit it on Monday. I was the Stars and Stripes audit. Um, the woman, the Greek woman, had run off with the money right before I got there, 
And so the Stars and Stripes office in Frankfurt was going to shut us down and, and uh, every month I had to inventory all the comic books, all the, uh, <laughs> all, all the, um, uh, candy bars and so on. And all, also they sent me on courier runs. To, these are some of the messages from the Liberty. Uh, I have a whole uh, notebook full of uh, samples, but uh, this is uh, one of the uh, first uh, messages we got. Rockstar, uh, we were fast charger uh, on Voice Highcom. You can see it says, I've been hit, need assistance. Um, we've been hit by a torpedo, starboard side, badly required assistance immediately. Uh, we are unable to identify the aircraft for surface vessels believed to be Israeli hel helicopters that circle the ship after the attack. Uh, we were trying to authenticate that signal, see if it was real. And um, was the Liberty armed? Did it have guns on it? Had four machine guns, which were knocked out early in the attack. So I had just, they'd sent me on a courier run. Um, when I first got there, I would go with a, one of the master at arms who, who was armed, and uh, he would drive and took me to the air base. Uh, the, the, RPS, the Registered Publication Office, was at the very back of the airbase, and as you drove back there, you drove past uh, warehouses. You've seen them, single-story warehouses, and um, with the loading dock on the front. As you uh, drove up to the uh, RPS building, it was a center block building with a vault door on front, had a uh, eight or 10 foot uh, fence with uh, concertina wire on top. You buzz the buzzer and the uh, officer in charge would come out and uh, they told me his name was Lieutenant Batshit. <laughs> but, but I never knew his real name, so we always referred to him as Lieutenant Batship. <laughs> he came out, gave me the, um, uh, we um, went through and inventoried, and so on the, is, on the uh, Six Day War started on the 5th of June. Uh, on the 8th of June, they sent me on a courier run, and I went up to the Master at Arms office, and they said, um, we're in lockdown, I, we don't have anybody to spare, you're gonna have to take your car, and, uh, and they issued me a, a sidearm of 45 and said, keep this under your seat, and you're authorized to use deadly force if somebody tries to stop you. So I went to their base, picked up the materials, mostly key cards for the crypto gear, came back to the spaces and they unloaded the um, crypto gear, or the, the boxes, walked in the spaces and it was dead quiet. Normally people are talking, people are laughing, people are, all I could hear were teletype machines. The teletype, uh, I found when my senior enlisted asking what was going on and he said, there's a ship that's been attacked and at that time we thought, well, who would attack a ship except the Russians? He said, uh, all the day workers are back in Voice Highcom. I went back to Voice Highcom and there was uh, uh, all the day workers plus I remember the XO was there. Um, my senior chief was in the process of throwing 
him out of these spaces because he wanted to handle the microphone. And uh, at that time, I'd only been out of OCS for a few months, and, and um, I thought an enlisted man doesn't have the power to throw a lieutenant commander out of the spaces, but I found out I was wrong. <laughs> Yep, the chiefs run the, uh, run the Navy. So, start the video. Uh, push the forward button again and let's see what happens. And we'll just start. Okay. Um, the marvels of electronics. Let's see. On June 6, 1967, Israeli Air Force fighters attacked Egyptian air bases, destroying 80% of their air assets. By June 7, the air forces of Jordan and Syria were also destroyed, mostly on the ground. But the war was being monitored. The United States and other nations had a vested interest in what was transpiring in the Middle East, and gathering intelligence was critical for both political and strategic military planning. What was the USS Liberty? Why was it in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea during the Six Day War? Why did Israeli air and naval forces attack? Can you hear it in the back? No. Okay. Why was so much effort put into the cover up after the war? Hello, I'm Colin Deaton, a veteran of the United States Army and Marine Corps, former history professor, book author. Welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. Liberty was a floating CIA intelligence gathering platform monitoring all transmissions from all sources involved in the 1967 Six Day War. Israeli progress was followed as well as the Arab coalition of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, known as the United Arab Republic. As a result, Israel secured Sinai, all of Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. But Israeli intelligence had reported to Chief of Israeli Naval Operations, Admiral Issy Rahar, that a ship had fired upon El Arish in Sinai. This was proven to be a ruse. The only ship in that area was the USS Liberty, which flew the US flag and was in international waters. In what was described by both President Lyndon B. Johnson and the Israeli government as a case of mistaken identity, Israeli air and naval assets attacked the USS Liberty on June 8th, killing 34 Americans and wounding 172 of the 294-man crew. Previously, the United States had announced that it had no naval forces within hundreds of miles of the battlefront on the floor of the United Nations a few days earlier. However, the USS Liberty was assigned to monitor the fighting. As a result of a series of United States communication failures, whereby messages directing the ship not to approach within 100 miles were not received by the Liberty. The ship sailed to within 14 miles off the Sinai coast. Also notified of the supposed attack upon El Arish were Colonel Shmuel Kislev, head of Israeli Air Force operations, and General Yeshiau Benket, the head of Israeli Air Force intelligence. Kislev told his pilots that Quote, if they could confirm that it was a military ship, they could hit it, end quote. The naval contingent was also on the alert. Benneket wanted to have positive identification of the ship that may have been involved. Israeli Dassault Mirage fighters passed by and gave their report. The flight leader confirmed that it was an American ship. More Israeli fighters attacked at 1405 hours for 20 minutes firing cannons, machine guns, and rockets, and one report from the first pilot who hit the ship stated that oil was leaking. During that time, on board Liberty, radio men Terry Halbardier and Glenn Oliphant followed the captain's order and broadcast in the clear that they were under attack by unknown forces and needed assistance, but their communications antenna were then damaged. They performed a manual repair and began transmitting in the open 
as their secure channel was being jammed. The 6th Fleet received the SOS and informed the commander of the carrier task force on board the USS Saratoga, Captain Joseph Tully, who called and launched 12 F-4 Phantom fighters to assist Liberty. And the hotline between Washington, D.C. and Moscow was activated. Moscow was informed that American aircraft were being launched only to surmise the situation regarding the Liberty, not to get involved in the war. But as the Phantoms were en route just minutes away from saving the Liberty, it was reported that Secretary of Defense, Robert Strange McNamara, mysteriously had them recalled. The only way a SecDef could do that was by presidential authority. Johnson knew the truth and he was part of the problem. The next wave of Israeli aircraft arrived after the Phantoms returned to the Saratoga, and these were Dassault Super Vestiers with napalm and canister bombs. One pilot called out the ship's identification as Charlie Tango Romeo 5, and that there is no flag on her. This was a strange report, as the previous recon flight clearly stated that there was an American flag, and the ship was identified as such. It is believed that this call was made as a ruse to cover the Israelis should these attacks be recorded by third parties. When that transmission was made, Colonel Kislev ordered all aircraft to stop the attack as he believed that the ship was, in fact, American from the call sign. But the Israeli commander of the torpedo boat squadron, Moshe Oren, stated that he was not informed that there was a recall from an attack and was informed, in fact, that it was the Egyptian freighter, the al -Qasir. Therefore, he launched three motor torpedo boats. The order to halt all attacks, which followed the second wave of fighters, was supposedly not received by the naval assets, whose three torpedo boats launched six torpedoes at the Liberty, with five failing to hit target, but the one that did contact killed 25 men and wounded many more. This account is in great dispute. However, the Israeli argument of misidentification fails for several reasons, one being that if they believed it was an Egyptian ship, why did they specifically jam the secure American radio frequency, which were specifically narrow bands? Another problem was the identification issue in that the Liberty at 10,150 tons was five times larger than the ship they claimed to have mistaken for the Liberty. Both ships had totally different profiles. In addition, if the attack was a simple error, why were the Israeli jets unmarked, bearing no Israeli symbols, carrying no national identification in violation of international law? Had the F-4 Phantoms from the Saratoga not been recalled, the torpedo boats would not have been able to engage, and the majority of the men would not have been killed and wounded. The official American position was that Israel called and said that they had recognized their mistake and the attack was over. So therefore, in response, McNamara recalled the jets. However, the attacks were then renewed for another 80 minutes. This was a strange development since the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv reported that the Israelis had attacked a ship, but the nationality of the ship was yet undetermined by Israel. If this was true, how would McNamara know to recall the Phantoms and that it was in fact the Liberty? The SOS was resent after the damaged antenna was repaired again, and it was picked up this time by the aircraft carrier USS America, and two ships were dispatched. Three life rafts were deployed so men could get off the burning ship, but the torpedo boats focused their fire, destroying two of the life rafts and sweeping the decks to kill as many men as they could to prevent an evacuation. That act alone is a violation of the Geneva Convention, not to mention attacking a ship from a non-belligerent nation in international waters. Another strange development was when after the two-hour attack, the ship and crew headed to Malta, the 6th Fleet Commander, Rear Admiral Isaac Kidd, ordered the survivors to remove the ship's name from their uniforms. In fact, Admiral Kidd even ordered them to go ashore in civilian clothes, which the men were not supposed to have anyway. They were also told to grant no interviews and do not discuss the situation, even among each other. Otherwise, they would face court-martial and a prison, or even worse, for violating national security. Both the Israelis and Americans involved had their opinions on what happened and why. 
One voice was that of Navy Captain Dr. Richard Kiefer, who was wounded badly himself, but worked for 28 hours straight saving lives when he could. He received the Silver Star. Captain William McConnell received the Medal of Honor for his efforts following the 13 repetitious attacks after his bridge crew were killed, himself badly wounded. His recollection was that the aircraft hit the ship from every direction in multiple waves. Since the attack involved the Israeli Air Force and Navy, that made it a combined arms attack, meaning that it was coordinated, which also meant that command authority came from the seat of government. The military did not simply attack an unknown ship in international waters, let alone an American ship, without orders. All the crew believed the ship was clearly identified as American, as there were reconnaissance aircraft that passed by close enough for the crew to look into the cockpits. Several high-ranking American military and political persons knew at that time that the attack was deliberate. The question was why. The cover-up was incredible. For example, the press was given limited information to downplay the event. The men were sworn to secrecy, and the Judge Advocate General of the Navy, Admiral Merlin Starling, was given only 24 hours to review the 600-page Court of Inquiry investigation report. He had great reservations about the veracity of the report. In fact, the Navy inquiry did not allow any testimony or evidence regarding the unmarked Israeli aircraft, no information was included about the life rafts that were shot up, or the electronics transmission jamming, or even McNamara's recall of the American fighters. This was the first and only time in U.S. history that a Board of Inquiry refused to accept testimony from American service members who survived an attack and only accepted the statements of the forces that had attacked them. Bill LeMay, a crewman, was given the name tag Smith, removed from a hospital ward with a dozen other patients and placed into a single room. A naval officer soon entered and told him that his name was now Smith, that he was never on the Liberty, and he was never to discuss the matter. In another completely absurd and totally insane turn of events, the Senate records, as well as the Medal of Honor Society, recorded that Captain McGonagall's Medal of Honor was earned in Vietnam, not off the Sinai Peninsula. His Medal of Honor citation mentions no specific geographic location and does not mention who the enemy was. Also, the ship's log was also altered to fit the Israeli timeline, supporting that only after 20 minutes of engagement, the ship was attacked for a total of 50 minutes and not two hours, breaking up contact after they realized their error. This was obviously not true. But why the cover-up? Why the attack? Over the years, logic mandates that the Israelis knew that the Liberty was a communications gathering spy ship and would be listening in on all communications, Arab and Israeli. Their push into the Golan Heights, as well as their attack in the Sinai, would have been recorded in real time by the Liberty. In fact, the director of the National Security Agency, Marshall Carter, stated that he believed the attack was deliberate so that Israel could maintain the secrecy of their operations. Sinking the ship and killing all on board was the only way for Israel to have accomplished that mission. The CIA transcripts were handed to the American ambassador in Lebanon at that time. The transcripts clearly show that the pilots, upon reaching Liberty, reported that it was an American ship. Their war room ordered them to attack. Again, the flight commander repeated his warning that the ship was American. Again, he was told, you have your orders, and the attack started. These reports were also supported by an EC-121 airborne surveillance aircraft operated by the National Security Agency, which also recorded these transmissions confirming that Israel knew the ship was American. They even stated in their own radio transmissions that they saw the flag. And this was true for both the air and naval <coughs> assets involved in the attack, contradicting their official statements. What came to light later was the justification for sinking the Liberty and killing the crew. Moshe Dayan, the commander-in-chief of Israeli forces, had ordered the attack. This was due to the fact that Israeli commanders in the field were authorized to execute Egyptian prisoners of war 
rather than lose time transporting and securing them. Israeli military historian Uri Milstein claimed that there were many incidents in the 1967 war in which Egyptian soldiers were killed by Israeli troops after they had raised their hands in surrender. It was not an official policy, but there was an atmosphere that it was okay to do it, Milstein said. Some commanders decided to do it, others refused, but everyone knew about it. Declassified Israeli Defense Force documents show that on June 11, 1967, the operations branch of the general staff felt it necessary to issue new orders concerning the treatment of prisoners. The order read that, because existing orders were contradictory, thus, one, soldiers and civilians who surrendered were not to be hurt by any means. Two, soldiers and civilians who possessed a weapon and failed to surrender would be killed. However, soldiers caught disobeying the order by killing prisoners would be severely punished. Now this appears to be damage control and could only have been issued from Diane due to the Israeli knowledge that they did not destroy the liberty and that intercept transmissions could prove these criminal actions. This appears to be a classic case of covering their collective rear ends. If this information were to have gotten out, it would prove that Israel was committing war crimes and the Liberty was a known intelligence gathering source. Israel's legitimacy was already in question since they launched the preemptive strike on Arab airfields as their intelligence supposedly had information that the Arab forces were preparing to launch attacks against Israel. American officials at the highest level would have known this, including President Johnson and Robert McNamara. It does not take a great stretch of logic to understand why the cover-up took place and from where it originated. The United States could not afford to have its great ally Israel accused of war crimes. The USA and NATO also had great interest in seeing the Israelis win because a victory would reduce the effectiveness of the influence the Soviet Union had with the United Arab Republic, which was the coalition of Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. It would also hopefully reduce the interest of Saudi Arabia in funding the United Arab Republic, triumvirate if their efforts seemed to be a lost cause, and Israeli victory would have also ensured that the Suez Canal would remain open, which benefited the USA and NATO. The US had good reasons for a cover-up. There are contradictory reports available where US officials claimed to have debunked the murders of Egyptian POWs as the reason for the attack, supporting the Israeli attack as mistaken identity. That is also part of the cover-up, because later, murdered Egyptian soldiers were found in shallow graves and the Israeli government offered reparations to the families of the men who were identified. In May 1968, the Israeli government paid 3.32 million US dollars, the equivalent of 28 million dollars in 2022, to the US government in compensation for the families of the 34 men who killed in the attack. In March 1969, Israel paid a further 3.57 million dollars or $28.5 million in 2022 to the men who had been wounded. In December 1980, it agreed to pay $6 million or $21.3 million in 2022 money as the final settlement for material damage to Liberty itself, plus 13 years of interest. Several prominent Americans, generals, admirals, and even Medal of Honor recipients, as well as the surviving crew, have asked for a full congressional investigation into the attack and the cover-up for decades. Personally, I doubt that will ever happen. Thank you for watching Forgotten History. Please click like, subscribe, and share. Send us comments and show ideas. Mm -hmm. oh, no. <laughs> to where? To where? Do you know where he's referring to? He said to contact him, and then it was cut off. Oh, well this, what we were looking at was one of many, uh, pretty good, uh, videos that are on YouTube. Uh, if you use that title, which we had on the slide, you can call that up and that has all his contact in Do you know what the title is? Uh, Forgotten History. When go back. Yeah, back when, when Israel attacked yeah. America, something like that. Well, we can flip back real fast. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Forgotten history. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. So, if you want to look at the uh, YouTube, there's I'd begin. I'd start with the uh, BBC documentary from the 90s. 
uh, which I, is the earliest one and, and uh, it's one of the best ones. Al Jazeera also has one that has a different take. And then recently there was a four hour video, but uh, I saw it before they started charging for it, so it's, uh, it's about 20 bucks. There's a few things in that video I want to point out that uh, uh, aren't accurate. The uh, first was he said it was a NSA ship. Now the NSA had their Navy, they had the Glomar Explorer that uh, brought up the K-135 uh, Soviet sub from two miles under the ocean, the, the Howard Hughes ship. They had their own army. They had uh, the Bay of Pigs proxy army. They had uh, uh, armies in Southeast Asia. And the, um, they had their own air force, U-Tube, SR-71, Air America, but this was a NSA ship. I think it's a CDIA. Yeah, and so you notice on here they said uh, the area was in Vietnam. Um, he received his Medal of Honor at the Navy Yard uh, while President Johnson was giving out uh, diplomas to high school kids four miles away. And that, the interesting part of that is most times when a Congressional Medal of Honor is given out, it's given by the President at the White House. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yet this was totally pushed off to kind of the side. <coughs> this one was, give, was given by an Undersecretary of the Navy at the Navy Yard. Yeah. So I'm open for questions. If there's well, any questions. Fact, sir, you were connected with the USS Liberty. I so think I uh, was originally slated to be on board when they were attacked as the electronics maintenance officer, but uh, I never did go. I was in Florida doing a, a project that lasted three years, and I <coughs> somebody else got the orders to the Liberty that I was supposed to take. Mm -hmm. And uh, the communications officer was killed in the torpedo attack, mm -hmm. and he was an officer that I knew and that had been to my house for dinner. <coughs> Uh, Jim Pierce. Uh, so I had a pretty close, and I went to the USS <coughs> Oxford. Oxford uh, as electronics maintenance officer when I left Florida. So I had quite a close tie with the Liberty, the Liberty people. Worked with some of them after the after the attack, and worked with some of them before the attack. Uh, <coughs> The whole thing was a cover-up, and people will say that the <coughs> that the Jewish government, the Israeli government, had undue amount of uh, influence on the American government, and and caused the whole thing to be covered up. Any more questions? Another question. I. I knew a couple of the guys in Ron the Liberty. Uh -huh. We went through NSA training together at Fort Meade. Um, they were Arab linguists, and I'm sure they were monitoring Arab military traffic. But after the Liberty was attacked, I was stationed in Berlin, and we had four NSA civilians that worked closely with us, and they all said, point blank, the Liberty was intercepting Israeli intelligence, and that's why they were here. Mm -hmm. and there was no question in their mind. They knew that the Liberty was well, they're, they're, The primary uh, intercept was, was Russian. To the last. Was the uh, Soviets. So, uh, and I don't think they even had a Hebrew linguist on board. They had uh, Arab that knew some Hebrew, but because that wasn't a uh, target that uh, uh, they were mostly Russian. Yes. There are two videos that you can rent, or uh, I mean, uh, check out at the uh, Westminster Public Library. Okay. One is a reenactment of the Six Day War. Okay. And then there's another one, and I have it in the car, and I forgot to bring it in. But 
what was interesting to me, which may not be so uh, unusual, but um, Egypt took control of all of the air coverage um, by the Egypt, I mean by the Muslims, we'll say, against uh, Israel. And the point was that the Israeli leadership made the um, Arab world think a whole different <coughs> lie. And they, they were able to accomplish this by this tight security of intelligence. And, but I never connected it to this. So I'm just saying it's worth checking out because it showed <coughs> how they deceived the world to win the war, basically, is what, is what they say in this film. And it's very well done. I don't know how much of it's accurate or not, but it's you know, a drop in the bucket. Of now, now, if you get a chance to see the BBC documentary, there's a, um, uh, they go to uh, Richard Helms, who was CIA director, and they said, uh, one of the researchers was going through the uh, Johnson Library at the University of Texas, and in the USS Liberty folder, there's this memo, and it says, uh, room 303 of the executive office and they ask uh, Helms what is this and he said well we it's a skiff and we used to hold meetings there and uh, if some of the covert plans we were talking about uh, went bad we could deny the president ever knowing about it so they said uh, also in this memo it mentions operation Sinai like the poison, and they, and they asked him, what was this? And he said, uh, I don't know anything about it, talk to McNamara. So they went and talked to McNamara, and he said, uh, I don't know anything about the Liberty, I haven't studied it, um, I don't know anything about Operation Sinai. They go to the head of, uh, of uh, the Israeli, the Mossad, and uh, said uh, they were interviewing him and they brought up Operation Sinai. He says, end of interview, turn off the camera, and I'm not saying anything more. So Operation Sinai, uh, there's been books written about that. Uh, as a uh, aside, Operation Northwood, after the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, the CIA and Department of Defense had a false flag, flag operation that they planned to uh, carry out to bring down Castro. And uh, I've got a copy of it up here. And it's, it's very specific. And one of the things is you see ship at Guantanamo or off the coast of Cuba and you blame it on Castro, and that's the uh, reason you, uh, to invade Cuba. Um, well, fortunately, that didn't occur. That didn't happen. Uh, Alan Dulles got fired by President Kennedy, um, and General Walker got fired, and, uh, but it's very interesting how specific it was that they were talking about what to do. Yes? Yeah, Jim, uh, in the 70s and 80s, I know in the Mediterranean, I was there on the Enterprise, and uh, we had Soviet intelligence gathering ships all around. Were there Soviet intelligence gathering ships in the Mediterranean? All, o all over. There were 20 Soviet ships, probably three Soviet submarines, um, and even today, there's, uh, they say there's probably 70 Soviet ships. There, uh, uh, last spring, the, I believe the uh, British Parliament discussed what to do about these uh, trawlers or research ships that uh, have capability of cutting undersea cables and, and destroying pipelines. Um, the Chinese have a, 
a ship that has four huge parabolic reflectors. They're so big that they look like the ship would flip over. Uh, Norway, uh, several months ago, was going to bar Russian uh, uh, intelligence ships. So they're still out there. Yeah, and they were, so the Soviet trawlers were out there at the same time, so they were intelligence gathering also. Right, the, the trawlers, the uh, Soviets used the, the fishing ships as a platform because they could put their electronic gear inside the refrigeration compartment and keep their equipment cool. And also it was a Faraday shield, so you wouldn't have anything leaking out. And so, and they were, they just blended in. And uh, so you really couldn't tell a fishing ship from a uh, intelligent gathering ship. Well, I think just in summary, we could certainly tell from this story that we have a complex strategic relationship with Israel. Uh, and it isn't always necessarily up front what exactly uh, we're going to say about them. And, you know, at times we don't criticize our allies, even though, you know, it's very clear they may have done something that's not in our best interest, you know, or, you know, for our allies and stuff. And it's going to continue. The Mideast, you know, continues to be a highly unstable uh, area. Uh, the Russians certainly are deeply involved in Syria and, and even Africa. And at times, it, I think at the strategic level, presidential secretary of state, you at times are making statements that you probably know are not truthful totally. Um, because some decision is made that in the long run it's in our best interest. And sadly, as we saw in this incident here, very much so, you know, innocent sailors and people got killed. And it's never been fully investigated uh, because it probably would show that you know, some of the, I, you know, I conspiracy things here were true. So, um, you know, the world's kind of a dangerous place to live in. Yeah. And again, our young soldiers, sailors, airmen are the ones out there uh, doing the best they can uh, with certain limitations put upon them by much senior leadership, political, you know, and military. But, you know, they'll do the best we can, and, and sometimes you suffer for it. So, yes, there more is, more than. Um, an organization that most people don't know about, and it's called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or the SCO, and that is China, Russia, the um, many and Iran, um, many of the um, uh, other Muslim countries that do a joint military exercises um, a few times a year. So that is a major um, organs, I mean, operation that is not covered by the media either. Well, we're in constant competition. <laughs> yeah. You know, with, uh, you know, the Russians, the Ch you know, Chinese, you've got Iran, you've got all sorts of, you know, groups out there. Yes, sir. <coughs> the Lieutenant that got the orders that I was slated for to be on the Liberty was a guy named McGinnis, and he was the officer of the deck when they were attacked. Uh, he wrote a book called Attack on the Liberty uh, that brought out quite a bit of stuff. Uh, several years later, the son of the engineer on the Liberty at the time of the attack did a lot of research and published a book called assault on the liberty mm -hmm. and that was probably the cleanest clearest report of what actually happened and who was actually involved and it has pretty much been suppressed mm -hmm. i don't know how you can totally suppress it from a private uh, you just publisher but anyway yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, Jim, I want to thank you for your talk and give well, you one of our Thank you very much. Challenge. Thanks for your help. Thank you.
And you may want to come up here and Jim can point out a bunch of the, some of the electronic stuff that he uh, picked up along the way. Yeah. And and thank I'm, you very much. And visit upstairs if you haven't. Be sure to visit the museum. And there's a car show going um, yes. right down the street right. at the Catholic That's Church. True. That's true. You know, an anti-car show. Oh,